Dr. George Beard wrote an article in a distinguished scientific journal where he describes a new condition he has come to be aware of. The symptoms of the condition include back pain, neck pain, headache, general fatigue, mental fatigue, insomnia, and stomach problems. As a cause, he blames modern life, and as a cure, he suggests everything from air, sunlight, happy diversions, and physical activity to a very special method he himself has come to favor, which involves putting the patients in a bathtub with water and applying general electricity to the head and to the spine. He writes in his articles that it works every single time. None of his patients ever came back for more treatment after receiving the shock in the bathtub. Um, besides from this somewhat untraditional treatment, um, the similarities of the condition he describes to the conditions we struggle with today is striking. The majority of sick leave is due to complaints exactly like this. My starting point was to look closer at one of the biggest groups affecting most people and accounting for the majority of sick leave costs in Norway today, which is the large group struggling with chronic back pain. Now, back pain is actually extremely common. In fact, it is more common to have back pain than not to have back pain. Uh, as much as 80% of the population will experience an episode of back pain at some point in their lives. So you guys are still young, but if you haven't already, you can be pretty sure that you will struggle with some back pain at some point in your life. And when I'm talking about back pain, I'm not talking about a slight itch or a little bit discomfort. I'm talking about real back pain. Now that's the bad news. The good news is that for the majority, the prognosis is very good, with improvements within a few days or weeks. The pain can be intense and the disability can be horrible, but if you just take it easy for a few days and try to regain normal activity as soon as possible, you'll be fine. For some people, however, the pain does not go away that easy, but instead develops into disabling conditions that dramatically reduce their ability to function at work um, and at home. Their pain is intense and their disability is severe, but still no organic findings can explain the amount of pain that we see in this group. There is actually a very low correlation between what we see on an MRI scan of the back and the pain intensity experienced by the patient. And biomechanical and anatomical findings are not able to explain the amount of disability that we see. We call them unspecific back pain simply because we don't really know what's going on. In very few cases, in about 10 to 15% of the cases, there is a specific cause. Uh, there could be a fracture or infection or cancer, but in the vast majority, we are not able to find a physical cause explaining the pain and disability. So what's going on? Is it all in the mind? And how do we deal with it? Should we put them all in a bathtub and apply electricity like George Beard suggests? Although a little bit tempting, I've used a slightly different approach. In my PhD, I wanted to find out who are these people, what are the complaints, and what are the important factors in the transition from acute to chronic back pain. To do that, I did a study on 600 Norwegian workers sick listed due to back pain. And one of my primary findings was that actually for the majority of these people, back pain was only one part of the problem. What we call comorbidity, or um, the occurrence of additional complaints, was very high. 99% reported other health complaints in addition to their back pain, with an average of 10 complaints, which is much higher than what we see in the general population. When we look at severity of complaints, we see that they report much more severe complaints than the general population as well. Uh, for, ins for instance, in terms of gastrointestinal complaints, which is stomach problems, or pseudoneurology, which is fatigue, anxiety, and depression. Now, this gives a slightly different picture than only a back problem but very similar to the conditions George Beard described almost 150 years ago. But I wanted to dig deeper, so I did a smaller study with a sub subset of these patients where I asked them what they themselves consider to be their main complaint or main problem in life. What I then found was that more than a third of these patients said that pain was not their main problem. Now, these are all patients sick listed due to pain, still pain was not their main problem. When I asked them what their pr main problem was, they reported a wide range, a wide spectrum of complaints, everything from problems at work and at home 
to emotional stress and other bodily um, complaints and disorders. And here are some of their answers. Job stress, conflicts at work, social anxiety, chronic fatigue, depression, low work coping, sleep problems, loneliness, activity limitations, migraine, and mother-in-law. <laughs> uh, this is not a joke. Um, and if you only knew about this mother-in-law situation of this guy, you would understand. <laughs> he, actually, he actually told me that, um, you know, at least uh, my back pain is somewhat predictable. <laughs> so there you go. Um, after my PhD, I moved to Boston to continue this work. My um, research findings from my PhD corresponds with international research and has led to the idea that there might exist different subgroups of back pain patients with different characteristics and different treatment needs. Anna, who has back pain and in addition struggles with anxiety and depression, might, for instance, have a slightly different need for treatment than Christian, who has back pain and in addition is in a huge conflict at work with his boss, or Bob, who in addition to back pain has a horrible mother-in-law. With my colleagues in Boston, we started where researchers usually start, namely to do a systematic literature review to see what previous research has found to be the most important predictors of chronic pain and work disability or sick leave. In other words, which factors are most able to explain why some people develop chronic pain and goes off on sick leave, while others don't? The answer is perhaps not the one you would expect, because the strongest predictors were not the anatomical or biomechanical, but the psychosocial. It is not how physically demanding your job is or how your back looks on an MRI scan that are most able to explain whether you will develop chronic pain or not. It is how you're doing emotionally and socially at work and at home. A few months ago, we did a um, study within the construction industry in Boston, and one of the construction workers I talked to there who struggled with back pain told me that the insecurity in the job market, and the instability, um, resulted in a constant fear of losing his job. He told me that the back bothered him, but it was this anxiety that kept him up all night and took away his sleep. Now, this guy had a heavy job that probably didn't make his back any better, but it is this anxiety that will put him at risk of developing vicious circles that long-term could um, reduce his ability to function at work and at home. The next thing we did was to um, include all these in most important psychosocial predictors in a screening tool and give them to 500 acute back pain patients that had just gotten back uh, pain in their backs. And the measures included, as you can see here, pain, depression, problems at work, uh, no hopes of recovery, life impact of pain, activity avoidance, pain catastrophizing, and activity limitations. After giving all these questions to 500 acute pain patients, we followed them up after three months to see how they did. And the results led us to an algorithm that divided these patients into four distinct groups. And as you will see here, I'll show you the groups, and the closer to the center they are, the less complaints, the further away from the center they are, the more complaints. The first group had some back pain, but no additional problems. These are the ones I referred to earlier, with a good prognosis. You have some back pain, but you know, just take it easy for a few days and it will pass. The next group had some more back pain, but as a primary concern had problems at work. It was some issues and problems at work that were bothering them most. Next group had some more back pain, no problems at work, but it's their physical limitation that really um, bothered them. Their ability to function at work and do their everyday activities that was most bothersome. And the last group shows um, the same amount of pain but in addition, a range of different emotional problems, including depression, anxiety, no hopes for the future, and avoidance um, of activity. Now, these four groups were very able to, um, with a high accuracy, we were able to predict outcomes after three months. The first group, as I told you, had a very good prognosis. All of them were back at work, no additional problems with pain or disability. The second and third group showed a medium risk of having some pain issues and being sick listed after three months, whilst the last group, this yellow group, showed a very poor prognosis. Almost all of them were on sick leave and were struggling with chronic pain after three months. We are therefore able to, with a very high accuracy, to predict already a few days after the pain has started who will develop chronic pain and who won't. And more than that, we're also able to say something about what characterizes them, whether it is the job, the work, uh, the activity limitation, or the emotional problems that is the worst. In that way, we can tailor treatments and give it to them already before 
they develop these vicious circles that we know they're trapped in and hopefully be able to prevent disability from happening already before it has started. So let's widen our perspective a little bit and see how this will look in real life. A worker goes from being um, ha healthy and relatively handsome to disabled due to back pain. What do we do? Well, the first natural thing to do is to look at the injured area. And for this guy, it looks to be the back. Um, from a medical perspective, to do a thorough clinical examination to see if there are some specific pathology that needs a specific treatment. But as I said, in most cases, we are not able to locate any um, specific findings, and there are no specific treatments. So then we move away from the pain, or away from the back, and into the brain. And the big million dollar question, is the pain all in the mind? Yes, of course, where else would it be? If I cut off your head, you can be pretty sure you won't feel any pain. I mean that mostly in a figurative way, of course. Um, but um, it doesn't mean that the pain is not real or that it's only imagined. You would think that we had sort of moved away from this whole dualism with separation of head from the body, but we still see it. So let me give you an easy example of how our mind influences our experience of pain. Are you ready? Okay. Let's say you wake up one morning, you are on vacation in Australia, and you are um, getting up of the bed, ready to go out to experience the city and look at the cute koala bears. So you put on your shoe, and suddenly you feel a sting. You quickly pull off your shoe, turn it upside down, and out falls a spider. Now the smart ones of you, remember that we're in Australia where there are poisonous spiders. How do you feel? How does the pain feel? How does it pulsate? How does it move upwards your leg? Can you feel it? All right, then come, come with me to a different scenario. You're back in the bed, you get up, put off your shoe, put, put on your shoe, feel a sting, pull it off, and out falls a pin. You know what a pin is? A small pin with a needle in the end. How does that feel differently? How does the pain feel differently in the, in the different scenarios? Do you see my point? Our pain experience is heavily influenced by our interpretation of pain. There are numerous examples of this, and we've seen it in numerous lab studies. Our pain is ex experience and intensity is heavily influenced by our interpretation of pain and our expectations of how much something will hurt. So does that mean that um, happy thinking will remove all pain? No. Does it mean that cognitive techniques can help you cope better with pain? Yes. If you focus all your attention around the pain, it is like plugging your brain into a guitar amplifier, where everything is experienced more stronger and louder. A continued focus on the pain, often related to a catastrophic interpretation like the spider, um, will result in an overwhelming pain experience. Whilst cognitive techniques can help you redirect your attention and change your pain interpretation so that the pain is experienced less extreme and are easier to cope with. A common uh, catastrophic interpretation in back pain is actually that pain equals harm and that uh, movement and activity is, is, is dangerous and harmful for the back, whilst in reality it's quite the opposite. All our instinct tells us that if something is hurting, if something is painful, it means that something is um, is harmed or something is wrong and we need to protect our back, we need to avoid activity. But in this particular case, our instincts are wrong and we need to reprogram our brain into understanding that so that we do what is best for us. And this is a technique that can be learned. Additionally, as you saw from my subgroups, some of these patients struggle with anxiety and depression in addition to the pain, which makes the whole situation more difficult to cope with. And in this particular case is where psychological techniques and interventions can be extremely helpful. So that was the brain. And as much as I'd love to stay here, as you saw from my research, there are more factors influencing the pain and the disability besides from what goes on in the brain. And one of them is the personal and social environment. Here is where we find the mother-in-law. And here is where we find a lot of factors that we know influence the individual's um, experience of pain and disability. For instance, financial problems, marital problems, lack of social support. The next... Um, system is the workplace system. One of the subgroups reported this to be their primary concern and problem. And you can have all the coping in the world of your pain and disability, but if you have a horrible boss or if you have extremely difficult work situations, you need to do some changes here before you can get back to work um, despite your pain. 
The next system is the healthcare system and access to evidence-based treatments. Now, what evidence-based treatments is, is a topic for another talk. But what I want to say here is that um, one of the biggest problems we have within this field today is actually over-treatment and medicalization. Way too many people are receiving spine surgeries, pain prescriptions, and unnecessary tests and procedures that are actually making them worse. We have good research showing that unnecessary tests and procedures early on actually worsens the prognosis of the patient. So we need to stop doing that. The next and the last system is the legislative and insurance system, which has a huge impact on particularly work visibility uh, related to pain. I believe in order to really see a change in the sick leave costs in Norway today, we need changes to the system. We need to incentivize the individual worker to go back to work to a larger degree than what our system allows for today. So all these systems, all these factors are involved in the individual worker's experience of pain and coping with the work, uh, with the pain and disability. So we need to work together. I realize that this probably looks more like the Olympic circles than anything else, but the point was just to show that we need the discipline, uh, different disciplines working together. I've made the argument for the psychology today and the importance of psychology for chronic pain, but psychology is not the only solution. There are some exciting studies from uh, genetic studies looking at chronic pain and gene environment interactions. And the most uh, impressive studies I've seen in the healthcare sector is actually um, several disciplines working together, including physio, ergo, occupational health, psychology, and medicine. Still, I think we need to take it one step further and include untraditional disciplines that we haven't done before, like some of the ones I've listed here, sociology, political science, law, economics, people that are experts within other systems that we don't know too much about. Because I think if we access them, if we look at this problem for only one disciplinary perspective, we run the risk of doing exactly like the blind man and the elephants, and I'm assuming you know about this analogy. They're all right, they're all looking at one little piece of the elephant, but they miss to see the whole picture, they miss to see the elephant. And I believe if we really are to see the whole elephant of um, pain, disability, um, we need to uh, work together. And we need to look at this from several perspectives, and we need to cut across our disciplinary boundaries and, um, and uh, collaborate. Because pain is not just pain, it is more complex. So, do we have any new answers to the questions old George Beard raised almost 150 years ago? Well, we don't really know much more about the physical causes of pain, but we do know more about psychological factors maintaining the pain and different ways we can help people cope with it. And we know that putting these patients in a bathtub with electricity is probably not a good idea. Thank you very much.